this video we're going to talk about proteins and how the structure of the protein determines its function and how the structure is determined. Proteins have very different functions in the cell. They, they really can do pretty much anything the cell needs. So we know that proteins uh, can do catalysis or catalyze reactions. Those are called enzymes. They can do transport, so they can carry, for example, oxygen as hemoglobin. They can act as defense or protection. So, for example, the, our nails are made of keratin, which is a protein, and that serves us as defense or protection from, from uh, injury. They can help, uh, work as support. So, um, building, building structures for the cell, for example. So, actin filaments that help support the cell are, are made of proteins. For motion, so this is like the, the proteins that make our muscles, they help us move and they also help the cells move. And uh, they can help us regulation, so some proteins are hormones and they can also be used as storage of energy and other things. And what determines the function of a protein is its structure. So the, the structure of the, of the protein tells us what is the function for that protein and there are unlimited structures that a protein can have and then limited types of proteins that we can form. And this, all these possibilities for proteins come from the way proteins are built. So proteins are made of amino acids and there are 20 amino acids but they have very different properties. So we have amino acids that are non-polar and we have amino acids so like this group. We have polar amino acids but they don't have a particular charge, so like water that is not charged but is still polar, is they have simply an uneven distribution of charges. Others that are charged amino acids and they can be positively charged or negatively charged. And we have aromatic amino acids and also uh, special kinds of amino acids. So amino acids, just to uh, take a look here, they, what gives them the identity is what we call the R group. R from the letter R, and all each amino acid has a different R group, but they all have the common amino and the common acid group. So this is the organic acid group, and this is the amino group, and every amino acid has that. So they all have this amino group, and they will all have the acid group. So you can see that that remains constant, and what gives them the identity is the R group, which is here in the highlighted in the white boxes. So every amino acid has a different R group, but they all have exactly the same amino and acid group. And amino acids are linked together by what we call peptide bonds. So this is a bond between the acid group of one amino acid and the amino group of the next one that results in a dehydrating reaction. So water is released and now we have um, um, dipeptide, which means a peptide made of two amino acids. So peptides is the name for a chain of amino acids. Each amino acid linked together by peptide bonds. And our genes are the ones that determine the order of the amino acids. So proteins are all coded by our genes, all the proteins we produce. We produce them because we have the instructions to make them in the DNA. However, the DNA is only coding for the order of the amino acids. So each triplet or each group of three DNA nucleotides is coding for a particular amino acid. So we have these triplets and they each are given the instruction for a particular amino acid so that the sequence of the DNA is determining the sequence of the amino acids in a protein. However, the sequence of the amino acids is only the beginning of the structure of a protein. So the, uh, the amino acid order or the amino acid sequence is what we call the primary structure. So this is the very basic or the very beginning of making, in the making of a protein. So once you have the primary structure, just the order of the amino acids, then the protein starts to fold. The next step is the folding into the secondary structure. And proteins can fold into secondary structure by fold, making these beta sheets or they can form alpha helixes. So these are the two main secondary structures that proteins form. And these secondary structures are formed by interactions between the amino group of one amino acid and the acid group of another one 
forming hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds is what is holding together the secondary structure of a protein. And then after the secondary structure is folded, the most complex form of the protein folding is the tertiary structure. So this is what happens next. So imagine the protein goes through several foldings. It's like knitting, um, I don't know, like a sweater. And the first structure, you will have the thread. And then you look at the thread, and threads are often twisted. So that would be the secondary structure. And then how you actually knit it into either a sweater or a hat that will be the tertiary structure. So there are, again, many possibilities for a protein to form, fold onto its tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is determined by interactions between the R groups. So if you remember, the secondary was by interactions between the amino and the acid groups. And all amino acids have an amino and an acid group. So that is a pretty set form of folding. But here, every amino acid has a different R group. So the possibilities on how they interact are very uh, wide. So there are multiple forms in which the protein can uh, form, but only one form is suitable. So the type of interactions these R groups can have, they can form hydrogen bonds, just like we said before, like the amino and the acid groups. Other types of R groups can also form these hydrogen bonds. They can form disulfide bridges, so these are proteins only for amino acids that have sulfide. They can form ionic bonds, so this is a pretty strong interaction. Or they also can form van der Waals attractions, which are interactions between hydrophobic amino acids. Phobic amino acids, they want to shield themselves from the hydrophilic environment or the water around them, so they will form these hydrophobic exclusion areas in which they're all folded onto themselves. So all these interactions result in the tertiary structure of the protein. And like we said, there are multiple possibilities, especially for a very long protein, in which they can fold into their tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is the most important for the protein function, since it's the, the ultimate structure the protein achieves. And for this reason, since there are so many options that a protein can fold, most proteins need assistance from other proteins, called chaperone proteins, in order to fold correctly. So chaperone proteins help the peptide as it's forming to acquire the form is necessary of the structure for it to function correctly. Some proteins might then, after they're folded into their tertiary structure, they might come together with other peptides, so these are other amino acid sequences, and form a quaternary structure. So not all proteins form this, this is just separate proteins coming together and forming a larger protein that is called the quaternary structure. So just like we said how important the structure of the protein is for its function, the same is true if the structure is lost. And that's what we call denaturation. So denaturing is when the protein unfolds. And this happens for mainly two reasons. Either because of changes in pH. So proteins, they have a very specific range of the pH that they, they can tolerate. And anything outside that will cause them to denature or if the protein is exposed to very high temperatures. Now notice that what takes, makes a protein denature depends on what the protein is, is meant to be. So for example, proteins in our stomach are used to be in, in very low pH, or in a very acidic pH, so that for them to denature, it would take an even lower pH than for a protein in other parts of our body that are used to a more neutral pH. There will be less likely to tolerate the acid pH in our stomach. Actually, the acid in our stomach helps us in digestion because it denatures the proteins that we're eating. So most proteins will be denaturing that acid, except for the proteins that are um, produced in the stomach, which are meant to, to tolerate that acidity. The same thing with high temperature. So most of our proteins will denature if they take temperatures higher than what we're used to. But there are some bacteria that live at very high temperature and their proteins are made so that they can tolerate that temperature. So there is no specific pH or a specific temperature that affects all proteins, but every protein has its own range and if taken outside of that range, it will denature. And when a protein denatures, it just simply loses its, its tertiary structure, so it would just become a primary structure or might, or might retain some of the secondary, but it will lose its tertiary structure that gives it this function. 
And this will change the properties. So you can see this when you're cooking an egg. It goes from being a runny egg to being almost solid. And this is happening because the proteins are denaturing from the temperature. There are diseases that can be also caused by proteins folding in a different way. So in this case, they're not necessarily denaturing, but they're acquiring a different structure. So this is the case of this disease that was very common a few years ago of mad cow disease that causes these nodules in the brain and, and um, is, it results in death in most cases because of impaired brain function. The natural protein has this way of folding. And then you have what is called the prion, and that is the misfolded version of the same protein. So the same amino acid sequence, that means the, the same, um, nothing in the genes has changed for this protein. It's just once this normally folded protein gets in contact with the prion, the prion version, it will misfold and it will turn into a prion itself. And when they misfold, they aggregate and they stack up together and they form these big clumps of proteins and those are those nodules that we see here that are the ones causing the problems in, um, in the brain tissue. So the, in this case, just contact with a misfolded protein causes a normally folded protein to misfold and then that would start to form this, this aggregation. So that's what a prion is and these prions are acquired by eating tissue that has these prions and then they will find their way into our normally folded proteins and cause them to misfold. But also the most common way in which proteins will misfold is if their primary structure is is not correct since the beginning. So this is what happens when you have a mutations and mutations will be changes in the DNA. So mutation is just a change in the DNA. That's what a mutation means. If that change in the DNA causes a change in the amino acid coded that could result in a change in the function of the protein. So it depends on where the amino acid change happens. So if it's in an area that is very important for the function of the protein or if it's in an area that is not so important and also what type of change. So if you're changing one amino acid for a similar one, let's say a polar for another polar that are more or less similar then that might not be such a big deal. But if you're changing the amino acid in an important place and you're changing it for one that is very different, that will result in a huge change in the function of the protein. That's the case of sickle cell anemia. In sickle cell anemia, here we have the primary structure of the normal protein. This is just a little bit. These are only seven amino acids in a very long protein. And this is the sickle cell version in the bottom. And the only difference is this amino acid here, the rest of the code, which is not shown here, is the same. But this amino acid in the normal protein is a glutamate, which is a, a polar amino acid, and is changed for a valine, which is a non-polar amino acid. So this is a very different type of amino acid, and it happens to be in a very important part of it. So that when, here we have the primary structure has been affected. When the protein falls into the secondary and tertiary structure, the one with the sickle cell gene is with the valine instead is going to form a very different structure. So the, the, quad, the tertiary structure is affected. This protein comes and, and joins all the proteins forming a quaternary structure. When that happens, that is also affected in the sickle cell. And the main difference here is that this new structure causes this protein to aggregate and form these long threads or long fibers of uh, ag aggregated hemoglobin. While normally hemoglobin will not aggregate, when it, once it reaches its quaternary structure, it would just stay in, independent and, uh, and uh, be able to take up oxygen. But here, since they form these aggregates, change the shape in, of the uh, red blood cells. So here we have normal red blood cells with normal hemo hemoglobin that is just, um, the globular form, so it's not, it's not uh, attaching to each other. And here, the sickle cells, they have these long strands, long fibers of, of hemoglobin that is attaching to each other, and that stretches the cells and changes the shape so that the cells can no longer flow easily through the vessels, and this causes all sorts of complications that are related to sickle cell anemia. So here we've seen 
ex uh, how protein function is determined and that is by the structure and then how the structure is determined and how can that structure change either by external forces or by mutations and how that changes the uh, function of the protein.